All right, well, hello again, friends. Um, last week, we were talking about the fact that there was a way made for us to escape the just and necessary punishment for our unrighteousness and our breaking of the law. Um, and we were told that that was a redeemer. Um, and so, spoiler alert, this week we are talking about Jesus as so we take a look at question answer 20 in the New City Catechism. So here we go. Question 20. Who is the Redeemer? Uh, answer. The only Redeemer is the Lord Jesus Christ, the eternal Son of God, in whom God became man and bore the penalty for sin himself. All right, so who is our one and only Redeemer? Uh, that's right, it is Jesus. And uh, Jesus, the eternal Son of God, the God-man, the Word made flesh. And for today, I just want to focus on the first and the last portions of this answer, um, which are the fact that Jesus is the one and only Redeemer, the fact that he has exclusive claim on that title. Um, and then the other thing I want to talk about is the fact that he gave up, willingly, he gave up the, the glory and the majesty that was uh, rightfully his in order to enter into the world as a man to pay the penalty for our sins. All right, and, and don't worry because we are going to go back and unpack the whole concept of Jesus being both truly God and truly man um, and why it had to be that way uh, over the next few weeks. Uh, so we're going to circle back to that. But today we're going to focus on those, those first two, or the first and the last concepts here in this answer. So first, um, Jesus is the one and only Redeemer, uh, without whom you and I have no hope whatsoever of escaping the wrath of God for our skin, for our, for our sin. Um, now, we live in an age of pluralism, right? Which means that it is, in our culture, perfectly acceptable for people to just pick and choose um, little bits and pieces uh, that we like from various um, religions and philosophies and kind of just put them together in some sort of a strange soup of vaguely spiritual belief. Um, our culture claims to have uh, a reverence for tolerance above all else. And so it's considered at best uh, impolite to suggest or to claim that there's only one true religion or only one true way to God. Uh, but this is the very claim that the whole Bible makes. And so it's incredibly important that we understand this. Um, Jesus often made exclusive claims about himself. Right? And when he was preparing his disciples uh, for life without him, after he was gone, uh, Thomas asked him, uh, you know, Jesus, how will we know the way? Um, and then Jesus said very famously in John 14, 6, he's, Jesus said to them, or said to him rather, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And of course, this is also the topic of one of, uh, another one of the most famous verses in the Bible, which is John 3, uh, 16 and following. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. That is an exclusive claim. Jesus Christ is the one and only Redeemer. He is the only way to escape the wrath of God and to be reconciled to God. All right? All right, and then the second point I want to address is the fact that God himself entered into our experience to save us from ourselves and from our sin. Um, God Almighty, the Holy One of Israel, right? The, the, the one who throughout the Old Testament was displayed as a pillar of fire and, and in the, the parting of the seas and in earthquakes and mountains falling apart. 
one so holy that when he rested on top of Mount Sinai, if people even touched the base of the mountain, they would just drop dead. This very same God has lowered himself to our level, entered into our experience of the world, and accomplished what we never could. He fulfilled the law perfectly. He perfectly lived out the standard of God's holy righteousness in this life as a man. And then, as the reward for all of his righteousness. He gave us the credit for it and then willingly went to die the death uh, reserved for lawbreakers like you and me. So Jesus lived the life that we should have lived and then he went and died the death that we should have died in order to set us free. Uh, 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, For our sake he made him, that is Jesus, to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. That is amazing. Because Jesus became the perfect satisfaction of God's wrath against our sin, we, having done absolutely nothing to deserve it, have become the righteousness of God. But even more than that, because that feels kind of impersonal. What does it mean to be the righteousness of God, right? Even more than that, John 1 says this, but to all who did receive him, he who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. So we become the righteousness of God through Christ, but not only that, we have been given uh, we have been given the right to become children of God. And as we read um, in church, for those of you who were there this past Sunday, uh, from 1 John 3, see what kind of love the Father has given to us that we should be called children of God, and so we are. Because of Jesus, and only because of Jesus, right, the one and only Redeemer, you and I are no longer enemies of God, waiting for his punishment to fall on us, but rather we have become beloved children of God. That's an amazing, amazing thing. Um, and we are going to spend the next few weeks uh, unpacking exactly how Christ accomplished that as both God and man. Um, but that's it for this week. So I'll see you next week.